we take down the Bibles and follow along with you in the next few moments as we study God's Word, the best way I can say this should be by the Word of God. We hope that we can find it in truth and that we take it in application. Part of the application of the Word, they won't spot it, but we believe you'll be a better service to God in the future than we have in the past. The passage that was just read for us in Hebrews chapter 10, in verses 24 and 25, it means that in verse 25, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Hebrews chapter 10, in verse 25, we often talk about the command given there. And it is a command. And we talk about you know, what it means to neglect and all of that. But what we need to consider is it's not just the command of God, but the responsibility that is given to each and every one of us as His children. That we have the responsibility to attend services together. And so what I want to do for a few all is just talk about the responsibility to attend. What's that responsibility given in the Scriptures? It's the things that we learn about this responsibility. Let's begin by understanding the responsibility. Let's talk about the responsibility stated. The responsibility is stated as such, not neglecting to meet together. Hebrews 10 and in verse 24. Now let's take and break that phrase down a little bit into two main parts. Not neglecting and the term meeting together. The term not neglecting, according to lexicographers Lau and Ida, means to cease, to stop, or to forsake. Be that, another lesson I've ever said, it means to separate connection with someone or something, to forsake, to abandon, or to desert. I'm going to go back and tie all this together at the moment, but right now we're just looking at the definition of these words. So the idea is we're not neglecting. The Greek word has the idea of stopping something, to cease from something, to separate connection from something, someone, or something. That's the idea of the black. So we're, so we're separating connection from. Now what it is that we're not going to black is to meet together. This Greek word translated meet together or assembly in some translations, according to Lavanaya, is a sense of the gathering together of group in the active rather than the passive sense. The access, a gathering together to or for an actual location meeting, the action of assembly. And so the idea of assembly is a, a coming together is this idea of this meet together. There's a coming together of something. We're going to talk about that just in a moment. But there's a coming together that's taking place. That's why I've been talking about it before, that as advantageous as, as streaming services can be when we're sick and when we can't be out, that it's not the same thing as assembly because they're not coming together that's taking place. So, sitting and watching it on, on the screen is good if you can't be here, but it's not the same thing as it coming together. So the idea is that we're not to separate from coming together. So, let's put it another way. If you take the definition of this phrase, not neglecting to meet together, it could be translated like this. Not, do not separate yourself from the coming together. Now, I have a parenthesis there, as we go further in the text, we say clarify, of the saints. That was under consideration. Church, assembly together. But the idea here is, do not separate yourself from the coming together of the saints. That is, when there's a coming together, you should be separate from that. You should be present with that. Now, let's look at the second part of this, and that is, some translations say, not neglecting to meet together. So other translations say not neglecting our own assembly together. So what's that mean? If you have a New American Standard, it says not neglecting our own assembly together. So what does that mean? Well, the Greek word that is found here, at any time, that is translated our own in the New American Standard, or is translated of ourselves in the New American Standard. It's this idea of ours, of, 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 of referring to something specific, our own assembly, or the assembly of ourselves. It's referring to the church to which they were part. The idea is they should not neglect the assembly together where they are a member. And so uh, here are those that are members uh, of this church in Hebrews. 
And the idea of not neglecting our own assembly together is that as they have opportunity, they should be present where they were members. That's the responsibility tied to them. Obviously, there are times it may be unavoidable that we can't always be at that one location. If you were out of town for something or uh, something prevents you from getting back, there may be a reason that one may not be present. And they may well, be somewhere else. But the responsibility is not only to be present in the assembly, but as much as possible to be present at the assembly where one is a member. So the idea, the responsibility is to the local church where one is a member. That's why one places membership as part of the local church. That's why Paul called the joy in the church was at Jerusalem. So that he could be part of the work there and he would be attending the services there. So our own assembly together is referring to the fact that as uh, that we should be present in the assembly where one has that responsibility as a member of the local church. And we've talked before about the necessity of the responsibility and, and, uh, and the need to place membership at the local church. So the responsibility to attend, the responsibility is stated as such, not to let to meet together or not forsaking our own assembly together. The idea is we do not separate ourselves from the coming together of the saints. And it's not separating ourselves from the coming together of the saints at the local body where we are here. But let's talk about the fact that the responsibility is neglected. The responsibility is often neglected. Lack of attendance is a major problem in the religious world. And I'm not just talking about those who claim to be Christians. I'm not just talking about the, the denomination. I'm talking about the religious world as a whole. When you take all of religion, attendance at religious services is way right down. I want you to consider some things from a, a Gallup article uh, written by Jeffrey M. Jones entitled U.S. Church Attendance is Still More Than Pre Pandemic. It was written, I believe, it was written sometime earlier this year or late uh, last year. So consider some of the things here. This chart may be difficult to see, but if you look at the chart, you'll notice on this green line here. This is how many people, the percentage of people called attended church services in the last seven, uh, last seven days. And so you go back to the 1940s, it's around 40%, and it dipped a little bit. Then back in the 50s and into the 60s, it peaked at around 50% of people called it into a uh, religious service. So they've been to church, the synagogue, the mosque, and the some religious service in the last seven days. And then that number steadily declined. But notice that as we come closer in the more recent years, the, number, the drop off right here, uh, where I'm pointing with the laser pointer, is 2010, and then the drop off from right now is 2023. In 2012, church attendance was around 40% of people polled had been to some religious service in the last seven days. That number dropped in 2020, as you can expect, during the pandemic, to below 30%, from around 28 to 29. And then the number has come back up a little bit, but it's staying around 31%. So if you take the number and you just look at the religious world as a whole, all different religions, attendance at religious services has seen a sharp decline in the last seven years, dating back to 2012, and it's dropped even more after 2020 and stayed down after 2020. <coughs> Joe said in the article, the coronavirus pandemic caused millions of Americans to avoid public gatherings, and many houses of worship were closed up under the spread of COVID-19. Still, Americans were able to worship remotely in services, podcasts on the internet, television, or radio. Most of those who reported attending religious services in 2020 said they did so worship. We'll look at a statistic there in a moment. Even accounting for remote attendance, however, church attendance figures were lower than in prior years. It is not clear if the pandemic is the cause of the reduced attendance, or if the decline is a continuation of trends that were already in motion. However, the temporary closure of churches and ongoing COVID-19 and activities did get many Americans out of the week or out of the habit of attending religious services weekly. And we'll continue with the quote here in a moment. But I think he put something out interesting in that second paragraph. I think he's right. It's unclear, and I would say very unlikely, the pandemic 
it is the exact cause of a lack of attendance, but rather perhaps that it had already in the world set in motion things that people, uh, once they had the excuse to not know in 2020, that the trend just continued, sort of set things in motion, because attendance was already on the decline. But there is no doubt that most pandemic the attendance of religious services is out. He continues to say in the next paragraph that attendance rates since 2020 are lower among nearly every major subgroup. So if you take all your religious groups and you put them together, it doesn't matter what subgroup you divide out, it's down. It doesn't matter what the political affiliation is, it doesn't matter the ones that this is the church service is down in almost every uh, demographic they pull. He said the main exception to groups had low levels of church attendance before the pandemic. Including it also the number of this affiliation of political liberals. So those who barely attended before, they're not really dividing because they still attend, but they just aren't really attending, uh, weren't attending much before at all anyway. It says church attendance is down four points from the Protestants from 44 to 40%, and seven points from the Catholics from 37 to 30%, the two largest faith groups in the U.S. Sample sizes for those who other religious groups are too small to provide reliable estimates for the period covered. In this analysis. So when you take Protestants and Catholics, the two largest faith groups in the United States, religious groups in the United States, both have since 2020 seen large drops. They were already seen steady drop, but they've seen more drop than a state down post pandemic. A 4% drop in the for Protestants and 7% for Catholics. Now the following chart here. Uh, is the number of those attending, uh, those that ten days in the church services remotely versus in person. And so that blue line on top is those that said they attended remotely dating back to April 2020 when the pandemic really began to pick up until April of this year, uh, when the around the time the article was written. And the numbers of those remotely in 2020 obviously were much higher because a lot of things were closed and they come back down to the normal levels. But even if you take remote and you take those in person together, they're still very low. In fact, that 31% of people that attended the last week, that uh, those little people, 5% of people surveyed attended <coughs> remotely, and only 26 attended the in-person service. So this just gives us the idea that attendance is now in many places. The pandemic had a profound effect on U.S. society and continues to have an impact in some ways. Americans have been less likely to attend religious services over the past three years, and at this point, it does not appear to church attendance will revert to pre pandemic levels. These recent trends have added to a longer term decline in religious participation that Gallup has documented over the past few decades. So he says, you watch the trend, it's going down, and the trend is that it only looks like the trend is going to stay down, and there's never any impact to before 2020. It just looks like the trend is going to continue to decline in religious bodies as a whole. And so that's concerning. Uh, just when you take into account what those that attend religious services is found, and it's not just these, uh, it's not just denominations, it's not just uh, other religious bodies that are affected, it's those of the body of Christ that are affected. I talk to many people and you say, well, how are things going? Well, and they tell you that since the pandemic, there's a decline in attendance. And attendance is now in many places. And so it affect, it is affecting not only uh, the process that happens when you go through these groups, it's affecting the members of my place whose attendance has the mind as well. But let's understand that we are not immune to this problem either. In fact, the following is a depiction of our attendance for the year 2023. The red line is our attendance on Sunday mornings, the yellow line, the green line. Uh, the yellow are, are Sunday night missions, not respectfully. The blue line is a little bit higher. That's gospel meetings. Uh, is the blue line. Uh, I can't remove all the lines. So that's the gospel meeting uh, line. And then the singing from five lines on the end of that. Uh, in that category as well. Uh, so that's the, the shorter line, the blue line. But if you look at this, obviously our attendance can go up and down. And there are reasons in, that this happens that we can easily explain. Maybe yeah, those who are sick. Those who will be present that are sick. Those who may be traveling out of town that aren't here because they can't be here for some reason. But we need to understand this is not always the case. There are times that we may look at ourselves and realize that we could be here and perhaps we've chosen not to be. The responsibility is neglected. Neglected in the religious world is neglected in the body of Christ. Now what we need to understand is not only is 
responsibility neglected, and sometimes we try to justify our neglecting our responsibility. We're not talking about not being, not being here because of reasons that we can't control. We can't control reasons we can't be here. Somebody's got poor health and they can't be here. Or somebody's out of time and can't be here. That's different. But we're talking about when we are not here, when we could try to be here, we try to justify ourselves in not being here. So perhaps we justify ourselves because we were too tired to come. And so because we were too tired, we couldn't come to service centers. Perhaps we try to justify ourselves by arguing that we have other commitments we've made, and so we've got to do these other things that we've committed to. Perhaps we committed to our sports team, or our work, or to go to some other event we agree to go to to someone. And so because we have these other commitments, we began to let these things that get in our way of our commitment to God. Perhaps we have made change and simple. Now, I'm not talking about the real take change, so one that is really sick. But somebody can't get up. For the right there, the caller later said he couldn't be here because he had a hard time walking this morning. We all know that might be sitting right there or right in the back and might be physically be here. We're not talking about those who have debilitating pain and cannot be here. We're not talking about those who are really sick. I'm not talking about you got the flu and you can't get out of bed. We're not talking about those who are really sick. I'm talking about that there are times when we may let every little ache and every little pain we use that as an excuse to not be here. We could be. But we use it as an excuse to try to justify something so we're not here and we use that as our reason. Or we have a little sniffle. I'm not talking about the call of full public call where we can't breathe but we feel awful or running. I'm talking about we let every little scream, let every little sniffle stand in our way. Do we have to be careful of us that we're not trying to, to, to justify ourselves for not being here? That we're trying to argue that we're not here trying to justify ourselves and make excuses for ourselves, or we're trying to justify ourselves and use other things and, and argue that we have other commitments when we have a commitment far higher than any other in our commitment and our service. Yeah. Now I'll ask this question here for just a moment. What if we neglected other responsibilities like the responsibility of the if we sit down and take a look at ourselves, or we look at ourselves and, have, and say, you know what, there are times I can do things that I have to do. And we look at ourselves, what if we neglected our other responsibilities the way we neglect this one? What if our percentage of times that we attended work was the same as our percentage of times we attended church services? What if we aren't here? And I'm not, again, I'm not talking about reasons beyond our control. I'm not talking about when we physically cannot be here, but when, we, when, when there are things we could that we could avoid, make sure we could work around and make sure we're here and we choose not to be here, we are in other places, then what if I was like that work? What if I showed up to work as often as I showed up to services when I could try to work around and make sure I was there? Or what if I was attending school the same amount that I was attending services? How would you call school? How would you call school if you showed up to work like you should at the services? Or how would your teacher feel if you showed up at school as much as you showed up at the services? But then he pleased. You're a model employee. A model student always here. But they say, we need to do a little bit better. What would they look at us and tell us, you know what? Maybe we don't have a job anymore. How would our boss feel if we were attending our work like we attend services? Would they be pleased or not? Now we must ask ourselves this question. How does God feel when we neglect to assemble the worship paper? After all, as we've seen the last couple of weeks, we talk about our worship. He is the Almighty God. He's the one that gave his shot up so that we could live. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Revelation talked about the holy, holy, holy Lord God Almighty. How does the Almighty God feel? The one who gave his son for us, the one who gave so much for us. We choose not to be here. You see, we take into account, we may take into account how our boss will feel if we neglect, or how the teachers will feel if we neglect, how does our world feel when we neglect to serve him? So we have a responsibility to attend. Responsibility is stated, not neglected, to make it again. The responsibility is neglected. It's a trend that is, 
in the religious world, it's a trend of measure, unfortunately, among the body of Christ, the attendance is found. But let's look, we talked about responsibility stated and responsibility neglected. Let's talk about the results of leading it or failing to lead that responsibility. Go to Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10 tells us what we do if we meet our responsibility, and it tells us what we do and what we face if we fail to meet our responsibility. Let me Hebrews 10, 24 and 25. If we meet, if we meet our responsibility, number one, we stir up others to love and good works. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. Not that like we meet together as is the habit of some. We stir up one another to love and good works. We can help motivate one another to love and good works. To be what we ought to be and our very presence can help stir up others to love and good works. Not only our presence, when we're here, then we can work harder at serving up others to love and good work. You see, by meeting our responsibility to be here, we stir up others to love and good work. It works, but not only that, we encourage others. Not to let you reach the other, this is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. And all the more, as you see today, we're all in here. What's your encouragement to be offered by the presence of some? You've heard me say this before. Uh, there are a few groups more encouraging than when you see older people who are struggling with health who choose to be here and no, no matter the pain they may be in, make it a priority to serve God and the young people who have given up activities that they could have engaged in to instead be present to serve God, their very presence in both those groups is encouraging. The presence of many others is encouraging. When we give up activities to be here, when we're here despite struggles and difficulties, and others see that, it can encourage them to continue on. You see, our presence can encourage others. By our presence, we can offer encouragement to others, not just by being here, but when we see someone else who may be down, we can encourage them. We can do that when we're here. When we come and meet together. But if we fail to meet together, if we neglect our responsibility, instead of stirring up one another, instead of uh, Encouraging one another, I was in verse before, but sometimes it can just be discouraged when others are not present, it could be. But if we didn't like to meet together, not only could it be the opposite, it could be discouraging, it could be not, and it could keep us from trying to place a lot of good words. Hebrews then would go on to tell us that if we neglect our responsibility, we have first and foremost sin deliberately. <laughs> For if we go on sinning deliberately, You've heard me say this before about this passage and many others. The word for is a very important word. When you see that word for, go back. Now let me set the context for you real quick. Hebrews chapter 9 and Hebrews chapter 10 is about the perfect sacrifice of Jesus Christ. The blood of bulls and goats cannot take away sin. And so you come into Hebrews chapter 9. In chapter 10, he's gone on wrapping up that first section about the superiority of Christ and Christ being better. And Christ ending it all, Christ being the superior or better sacrifice, the only one that can truly take away our sins. He then comes in that text, beginning in verse 19, and talks about our responsibilities. And so beginning in verse 19, he said, Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence that there is all the only place places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way, they open for us through the curtain, that is through the flag, his flesh. And since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart, in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from the evil conscience, and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without laboring, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another a lot of the works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the words you see today drawing near full. 
So you take verse 26 and you go back to the previous verse. Here's how you live. Those that have the confidence, those that draw near the true heart, those that hold fast to the best of their hope, those that stir up others, those that attend this, those that are coming together, those that are encouraging one another, if we neglect any of those responsibilities, he says, verse 26, if we fail to meet what we know we need to do, we go on sinning deliberately. We know what we need to do, but we choose to do something else instead. We sin deliberately. And, according to verse 25 and 26, that would include forsaking or neglecting the leading together of the saints. So, when we choose not to be here, we go on sinning deliberately. When we choose not to be here, verse 29, we have trampled underfoot the Son of God. Look at verse 29. How is worse punishment do you think will be deserved by the one who trampled underfoot the Son of God? So we trampled the Son of God underfoot. We have profaned the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified. We have profaned the blood of the covenant by which we were sanctified. Well, the New King James says, Count the blood of the covenant is a common thing. And have insulted or outraged the spirit of grace. That's what the Hebrew writer says in 10, 26 through 29, is God would be neglect to be here. We have sinned deliberately, we have trampled underfoot the Son of God, we have counted the blood of the covenant as a common thing, and we insult the spirit of grace. What that means is, if we neglect, and we and we've done these things and it's you know sinned deliberately and all these others. It means we no longer have a sacrifice for sins. That's why it's important to tie back to verse chapter 9 and 10. There is one perfect sacrifice. There is only one sacrifice sufficient to take away sins. That is the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. If we sin deliberately, if we choose to neglect His will, there's no sacrifice left. If we neglect the sacrifice of Christ and neglect the will of Christ, there's no sacrifice left that is sufficient. And unless we realize that we need to come back to God, we realize we sin deliberately, we have a change of heart, as long as we have that attitude, there's no sacrifice for us because we've rejected the only one there is. The only one that can take away our sins. And because there's no sacrifice for sin, instead we face a fury of fire. But a fearful expectation of judgment and a fury of fire that will consume the adversaries. And we fall in, and that fury of fire is because we fall into the hands of the living God. For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, and again the Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. You see what the, what the Hebrew writer is pointing out to, to the audience that is listening in? You need to make sure that you're meeting all of your responsibilities. You need to make sure you are living as you've been called to live. Because if you choose to reject the will of God, if you choose to reject Christ's word, once you do that, there's nowhere left to turn. There's nowhere left to go once you reject Him. And unless you realize that He's your only hope and you come back to Him, you've got nowhere to go. And instead, you face a fury of fire. Instead, you fall in the hands of the living God. And he says, it is a fearful thing. That's why Paul said, when he's five and verse 10, would point out that we all stand before the judgment seat of Christ and give an account for how we would do the body. For the need you know whether we do good or evil. And then goes on in verse 11 and says, No one therefore the terror of the Lord. And there's no one knowing that we can be punished if we do wrong. And the punishment we face, we persuade men. It's because it's that fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And if we sin, if we sin willfully, if we sin at all, if we neglect our responsibilities, any of them, including the responsibility to attend, we face the wrath of God unless we repent of The responsibility to attend. The responsibility is safe, not neglected. Together. That is, do not separate yourself from the coming together of the saints. Yet the responsibility has been neglected in many places. We see the result of the meeting, that we encourage others to stir up others, but if we neglect to meet it, then we fall into the hands of the living God and sin deliberately. We have trampled under foot. But how do we solve the problem? What's the solution to neglecting our responsibility? 
Perhaps you look at yourself and say, you know what? I realize that I have been kind of neglecting my responsibility. What's the solution? Well, number one, resolve to be. What did Daniel chapter 1 do? Daniel chapter 1. The story of Daniel chapter 1 has to do with as they come into the land and they are offered the king's delicacies. And in verse 8 of Daniel chapter 1, it says that Daniel resolved. Your translation may say he purposed. Not to defile himself with the king's food or with the wine he drank. Therefore, he asked the chief of the units to allow him not to defile himself. Daniel didn't make up his mind when the food was put before him. Daniel made up his mind long before. He had purposed in his heart because he knew God's will and knew what would bind him. And so the choice was pretty simple. I'm going to keep God's will and I have to. To find the these king, the king's delicacies. The reason he did this is because he had made up his mind. You see, what we need to do is we need to make up our mind no matter what that we're going to do. We look at ourselves and say, I'm struggling. I'm not always here when I could be. We need to start by making up our minds. By telling myself, I'm going to be here no matter what. And so if we choose, if we make up our minds to be here, then we will choose to be here. See, decisions are harder if we make them case by case. If you have a general set of things that we're going to do, a general set of rules when it comes to things, then when a conflict arises, we're going to go back and follow those things. But if we sort of evaluate case by case, am I going to do it today or am I not going to do it today? And we evaluate it one day at a time, it gets a lot harder to make the decision. But if we make up our mind that no matter what happens, I'm going to be here, it makes the choice to get out of bed on Sunday morning to get dressed and drive services a whole lot easier. We've got to make up our mind that we're not going to let anything stand in our way. What's the solution? Well, we were all being here number one, number two, we remember that we're commanded to be here. So we understand we must keep God's commandments. So now, Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you? You want to be 10, 11, 13? But to fear the Lord your God, to walk in His ways, to love and to serve the Lord your God, to love your heart, to love your soul, and to keep the commandments and statutes of the Lord. He's not just something you want in the Old Testament. He tells us today that if you keep His commandments, Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. We must keep the commandments of God. In fact, the uh, wise man's song will put out of Ecclesiastes 12, but that is what they say. The Spirit of God keeps His commandments. And we need to understand that God is commanded to be here. Hebrews 10, 24 to 25 is a responsibility, a commanded responsibility, not a suggestion. And we must understand that God commanded us to be here. We will remember that there's a command to be here, and that we must keep God's commandments. Then we need to understand that we can be here. Then we need to understand that we must be here. Then it makes it easier to be here. So when we remember that God commanded it, and that we must, that we must keep His commandments, then it makes it easier to make that decision. How do we solve the solution? Well, remember the people. We need to resolve to be here. We need to remember we can't be here. And finally, we need to remember it's a privilege to serve God. John 9 31. The blind man is asked, Who is you? Who, who healed? He told a lot of them. But he knew that he was a righteous person. And his argument for that is verse 31 of John 9. We know that God does not listen to sinners. But if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, God listens to him. Not just, the, not just the John 9 and the body who said that. There are inspired writers who said that as well. Who talk about the fact that God doesn't hear the prayer of the unrighteous, but it does hear the prayer of the righteous. God hears those that are his servants, but it doesn't hear those who sing. You see, we need to understand when we obey the gospel, we've been adopted as children. We have the privilege to come to God and cry before Him and the Father. For you do not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, Romans 8 15. But you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. Not everyone has that privilege to serve God. Not everyone has that privilege to come and cry out to Him, Abba, Father. 
Not all have been adopted. They can be if they choose to be, but not all have been adopted as children because they choose to protect the will of God. That's what we saw in Romans 9 through 11 about the Jews. Some of them didn't have that privilege because they rejected God's plan. But we have the privilege as his children, as his adopted children, to cry out, Abba, Father. We have the privilege to come to him, to pray to him, and now we will hear us. To sing songs of praise to Him. To come together and worship Him. Knowing that as long as we serve Him faithfully, He will accept our worship. Not everyone has that privilege. Yes, it's a responsibility, but it's far more of a responsibility. It's a grand privilege. We have the privilege of serving God. And we should be here to serve Him. We have the privilege, and we should be here because of that privilege, to serve Him. Serve God all the days of our life. And then one day, not only can we cry out when we serve God the Father, but we can think of the Father forever and We have responsibility. We have many responsibilities. But what are those responsibilities? Not neglecting to meet together. That's the responsibility. If the responsibility is neglecting to meet together, as we saw this morning, is neglecting to the religious world, and neglecting to those of the body we need to understand that if we need our responsibility, there's a reward. But if we neglect our responsibility, there is punishment. We need to understand how to solve it. Or if we realize we're neglecting our responsibility, we need to make up our mind. We're not going to move any longer. We're going to keep God's plans, not to serve Him, remembering that it's a privilege. A privilege not everyone. So we're going to close the sermon this morning. Maybe you'll hear one more question to do. Not yet responded in obedience to the gospel. You've not yet become a child of God, so you don't get to have the privilege to cry out for love. But if you're here and you've heard the word of God, you believe that Jesus is Christ, the Son of the living God. Would you not repent your sins, confess your faith in him, be buried in the lives of baptism, rising up to walk in the newest of life, being adopted as a child of God, having that privilege to serve him? Maybe you're here and you've done that, you're somewhere along the line, or this faith that God is going to do. Sin of a Bible, you should take him privately in prayer. Send a public answer to try to first the congregation. We'll die after we for you for that reason. No matter what you need, this is just a good way to try to put right life together and say, and that's the same.